And as you heard me say this morning, this is a subject I'm very interested in, having seen how difficult Lancaster found it and how shocking people found living without electricity. So I'm really looking forward to hearing from Roger uh, from the Lancaster University about how we can do it and what we've learned from Lancaster. Thank you. Thank you. I'm from Lancaster University, as you gather. Most of us at the university and faculty were living in and around Lancaster at the time of the events of Storm Desmond. Three months later, in March, we held a workshop where we invited some 20 odd groups from within Lancaster to come and talk to us about their experience. The end result of that workshop was this report, Living Without Electricity, which is available on the web. And um, it was published by the Royal Academy of Engineering with a forward by the government's chief scientist saying, this is important, please think about it. Mm -hmm. Since when I've had inv invitations to speak at something like 20 different functions, some of which I've done, some of which my colleagues have done. It's been really exciting to see how the ripples from living without electricity here have moved into the wider community, particularly, perhaps because of the ge geographical reasons of where rain happens most often. We've seen a lot of interest in Scotland, a lot in North East England, quite a lot around here. And I've also been down to talk to groups of soldiers in Birmingham about what they would need to do in the event of this sort of event happening again. But it's actually a lot more difficult if you're a soldier dealing with something like the loss of electricity than it is if you're dealing with something relatively straightforward like a flood where you just have to put loads of sandbags. But then, I'm an electric engineer, so I'm a seaman. I'm sure everybody knows, as we talked about earlier this morning, about the um, Storm Desmond, which dumped something like 350 millimetres of rain on certain bits of Cumbria. And our nice, tame, friendly river developed a peak flow of something like um, 1,700 tonnes a second, which would fill an Olympic swimming pool in about a, minute, a second and a half. So, a lot of water, as Caroline was talking about this morning. In terms of straightforward hectares of flood, frankly, it wasn't very impressive. <laughs> this is a map provided by Jordan Survey, which shows the flooded area. They didn't actually show the city centre bit, but I had to fill it in myself. And um, this, this was the extent of the flood, primarily, as I'm sure you're aware, down in this um, area there. So not really very many houses not the sort of thing by itself would have gathered a lot of square feet of newspaper coverage. That's what, that was the substation. And I think the interesting question is, why on earth is it there? And that is best answered by this. This is the power station circa 1970. It was built originally in 1915 when there was a munitions works here. They needed a site that had access to cooling water and access to coal coming from Yorkshire. So this is the railway line going to Yorkshire, coming from Yorkshire, and that's the cooling water. So here was the obvious place to build your power station, and it went through various generations until you got here. Then in 1975, it was shut. And the last half decent flood had been in 1907, and if you go to the other side of the river, you will find that it says height of flood. Uh, no one at the time could justify all the disruption of moving the power station and also the cost, so it was decided it would just stay there. And I think this is a very fundamental point, that in Britain an awful lot of our infrastructure isn't there because it's planned, it's there more by accident. And we've lived with it, not how we would have wanted it, perhaps not with the capacity of the um, subterranean river through Lancaster or the substation being the right place. But in general, we've taken the view, oh, it's there, don't touch it. And that, I think, is going to be very significant. It's, that's a valid assumption to make while everything else is, is static. If life's changing, and if climate is changing, then things are going to get very different. So, this was the flood. 22.39 on 5th of December, um, I was watching a Scandinavian noir drama on <laughs> Channel 4, or BBC 4 at the time. It was distinctly off-put that I couldn't actually see the rest of the end of it. Um, and it was not fully restored until the 8th of December. 
It's interesting, Northwest did a brilliant job bringing um, generators from all around the country. If you went around the town, as we did on some Sunday afternoon, you found groups of people with, with Northern Irish accents, you found groups of people with um, country accents, all with their brought their generators. What's significant is that, yes, this was fine in Lancaster, but if we had the situation where we lost Birmingham, it would need 750 generators, and there aren't 750 portable generators like that in the country. So they basically connected up the generators as a short-term stopgap. This was the workshop that we held in, um, in the university. A lot of contributors, lots of academics. We also had people from about five different government departments, including Cabinet Office, um, what was then I think still called DEC, Ofgem, and various other groups. And these are some of the conclusions. The first thing was that we lost the internet. Now, it doesn't actually require a degree in nuclear science to work that out. If you were to go to this box here, and walk around the side just there, you will see a notice that says danger 230 volts. Kind of gives the hint that it rather relies on electricity coming in the street. <laughs> yeah. We also, of course, lost power in homes, broadband, routers, and all that sort of stuff. <coughs> Fixed line phones sometimes were fine. Um, if you have a phone, it doesn't have to have a dial like this, I just chose that. <laughs> you can have push buttons if you want. Um, you're fine. If you've decided to go for a, a wireless phone, like the one over there, forget it. More importantly, if you're a solicitor's office or a GP's office, and you rely on a PABX system where the receptionist has a phone like this on their desk, and they can then call up the relevant parts of the organisation, that was also not working. And I think this was something that lots of people didn't realise. I've got a nice, properly wired phone on my desk at home, and I thought, right, I'm not, I really felt a bit smug about this, actually. <laughs> Until I realised I don't actually have a phone book anymore. All my phone numbers are actually stored in the phone. And to get them out of the phone, I needed to plug in. So I was going around by sort of candlelight and things, looking for my old diaries to see if I could find any numbers in any of them. Mobile phones went off. Some of them stayed on about 15 minutes, 20 minutes or so. A mobile phone a base station, um, G3, G4 sort of thing, takes typically about a kilowatt, sometimes up to two kilowatts. So if you want something that's going to, a battery that's going to tide you over a couple of days, you're probably talking about 30 or 40 kilowatt hours which is much the same size of a battery in something like a Nissan Leaf car, and we all know what they cost. Mm -hmm. So the economics of saying, let's put bigger batteries in here, are really a bit iffy. So that there are other solutions that we could talk about. The effects of households, <coughs> Caroline was talking about this morning, all fairly straightforward. Central heating, even if you've got gas central heating, it has an electric control system, it has an electric um, circulating pump. The TV and digital radio, I'll give you these as slides if you like, you don't have to take copies of them. TV and digital radio um, basically came from a substation or a sub-transmitter in Lancaster area, um, so that all went off. No internet. Interesting things, powered garage doors. Um, you don't think of that, you know, like the sort of access, just like you <coughs> access to things, you push the button, the door opens. I know quite a few people who have powered garage doors without a side access from their house. And you wonder, well, quite how would you, do you expect to get into it? None of these things is particularly rocket science. They're all really just saying, well, you know, what have we got? What uses electricity? What can we do about it? This is where the issues of social justice come in. For those of us, um, and I can see one or two people around the room who have had personal experience of this, um, for those of us who are lucky enough to have a garage with lots of camping kit in it, who have a gas hob that, that doesn't need um, electricity, who have a log burner where you can you feel like a boy scout and <coughs> wrap potatoes up in aluminium foil, all that sort of stuff, life's fine. For those who live in flats with electric heating, electric cooking, electric lights, extractor fans to keep the environment half decent in the um, in, inner rooms, 
a water supply that relies on a pump to get it up to the higher floors, people who rely on lifts, people who rely on entry phones. That is a very different environment to those of us that are lucky enough to live in this sort of environment. And I think it's quite significant that the way that climate change and the way that living without electricity affects different social groups is actually quite important because it is very different in different groups. Fortuitously in Lancaster, Maine's water supply was generally reliable. We've got that lovely big reservoir about 100 metres above the city. Um, there's some sort of filtration and chlorination plant. I don't know where it is or what it does, but it obviously kept working. The sewage network didn't flood. Um, I've talked to the people from the sewage disposal part of the businesses, and they say, well, they've got backups, so that was all right. Gas supplies were fine. Gas supply itself used to operate off gas engines. They've actually changed them now to a lot of the gas engines are being replaced by um, electric pumps, because it's actually an easier way of pumping um, stuff around. But luckily, they do have backups. And this is something I have discussed, actually, with the um, previous chair of the uh, National Grid that's responsible for the main grid, for main gas grid. And um, they are very well aware that even though they're now switching to the more efficient electric pumps, they have to maintain sufficient capacity to actually run the gas network without electricity. The hospital was actually in quite a good position. They had lots of generators. In fact, they had a super, superfluity of generators because they had spare generators and then spare generators. They couldn't actually share that electricity with anybody else. They couldn't contact patients. They couldn't contact quite a lot of their staff because the telephones weren't working. Quite a lot of more A&E patients turned up because some local surgeries weren't operational, walk-in clinics weren't operational, the 111 or whatever it is, 101, 111 telephone line um, couldn't get hold of. So people came in off the street, both for A&E and also for the facilities. We had, in fact, a group of people, quite a large group, who came in to just use the canteen. Now, I guess nobody would normally think, I want an oat cuisine meal, let's go and try the hospital canteen. <laughs> but it's available for the visitors to patients, so why not use it? And in fact, I think they got through about a week's worth of food in the first day. And this is probably another fairly significant question that came out of Lancaster floods. Where do you turn in a crisis? Now, back in medieval days, it would have been the castle. That's where the seat of power was, that's where you went. Somebody would either um, help you, tell you to sod off or cut your head off, depending upon how you fit <laughs> into the current society. In Victorian times, it was the town hall which was all powerful. It ran Lancaster waterworks, it ran Lancaster gasworks, it ran the tramways, it ran absolutely everything. They had quite a bit of flexibility, so if they needed more people working on the trams or more people work working on the water, or at one time actually, for a number of years, more people working on the electricity substation, they could transfer people around. And they were all sufficiently close that they could actually talk to each other and make things happen. And I think the big question we came up with in this discussions, these discussions we've had is what actually replaces that now within the new privatised, deregulated, profit, profit, profit type organisation. Laura Bank Care Homes, which is just up at Meeting House Lane and keep going for a bit, um, had quite serious problems. They obviously had no light, no heat, no hot water. They thought they had cooking, but for health and safety reasons, the gas cooker was interlocked with the electrical extractor fan. So if the extractor fan wasn't working, you couldn't switch the gas cooker on. They have a call system from all rooms back to the central, I'll call it reception, I'm not quite sure what they call it, um, but that of course relies on electricity. They have a PABX system, so nobody could actually phone in or phone out until one of the staff went home, took an old telephone from the attic, came back and plugged it into the, into the fax line. But how many people are going to keep a fax line for the next decade or so. The chef actually made a barbecue in the garden, which is pretty impressive when you remember this was Storm Desmond, it was raining and a bit wet and stuff. Relatives brought in a camper van, 
with Calagas cooking and made hot drinks. And they muddled through. And I think this is part of what Caroline was saying this morning, that relatively small communities did muddle through. Larger and more amorphous communities probably find it more difficult. Increasingly, policy in Britain is for care in the community, that people are discharged from hospital, either to their own home or to some spare room in somebody else's house, depending upon how you see yesterday's newspaper. And quite a lot of these houses are specially modified. They may have chair lifts. There's probably a carer alarm system where the person has a dongle around their neck. If they have a problem, they push the dongle, which sends an electric signal to an electrical, electrically powered um, receiver in their house, which dials up on the phone, which then goes into the care giving centre, who then use a mobile phone or a text message to ask the carer to come. So in that little chain of events, there are probably about four different ways in which loss of electricity will cause it, cause it to fail. If people need a dialysis machine or an oxygen concentrator, they're all, again, plugged into the mains. So basically, <coughs> our entire caring community structure is predicated on having continuous mains electricity. The primary school, we had the head teacher of this particular primary school, came to our um, She couldn't communicate with staff, she couldn't communicate with parents, the access control wasn't working. There was an alarm system, but the alarm system, because it was best value contracting or something, um, actually routed <coughs> all the alarm messages to some poor guy in Belfast, <laughs> <laughs> who was then expected to phone up. I don't know, Kurt. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, there's nothing wrong with Belfast. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I assume it's Belfast you're from, not the primary school. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so there, there was. But messages were, were very rooted to Belfast. This poor guy then had to phone up the head teacher and say, I've just had a message saying your school's been broken into. Oh. Of course, without the right phones, that was not much use. There was no road lighting, so there was no crossing control. And so even if she'd been able to survive in the school, she considered it would be unsafe to get uh, pupils coming in along dark roads without the access control. And this is another fairly general point, that with the academisation programme, there's been really very little um, local content and local management that can make decisions. Now, luckily, the problem happened Saturday night, which meant on Sunday all the school heads could get together, and one of them at least paint, took a um, pillowcase and wrote on it, school closed until Wednesday, and felt tip and pinned it to the walls of the school. That was how they were communicating with parents. Had it happened at, say, 10 o'clock in the morning on Monday, when parents had dropped off their kids and had all gone off to work, they'd probably left all their contact details with the school, because the school keeps text message addresses, it keeps email addresses. I haven't a clue what would have happened. It would have been a very different experience. Booths has a contract. Um, I live within walking distance of Booth's, that's okay. Uh, walk for, for me at any rate. Walked around and had a look at Booth's. It had queues everywhere. People buying up everything they could find. The automatic teller machine, the cash dispenser, which runs off mains electricity and uses the conventional um, wired telephone lines, was still working. The electronic tills were working, but of course they couldn't accept credit card payments, debit card payments, touch payments, or anything of that sort. There were no other supermarkets open, and there were no other ATMs around in town. The shop closed at 1600, when there were still queues everywhere. And I spoke later to the um, manager of the shop, who had actually been stuck outside Lancaster when these things happened, and he got back a few minutes before 1600. He didn't actually say it's more than my job's worth, but he, he might have done. So who is actually responsible, or who can say, look, forget Sunday training, these people want food, we've got food, let's sell it to them. And that's another issue, that with the existing structures we've got, commercial structures, management structures, organisational structures, 
there is very little empowerment of individuals to make decisions that go against legislation or rules. Luckily, things were all over in not many days. But it's also worth remembering that nowadays, ordering is done automatically. If booths, electronic tills, register they've sold a tin of soup, that message gets sent back to some warehouse automatically. Somebody loads that t another tin of soup or packet of whatever into a van and it comes up. Without electricity, the restocking process doesn't work and no longer do sh the shops hold stores behind out of the sight of people. Everything is just in time. And that, I think, is another fairly serious issue that just in time working, well, it's good in that it means you get this week's green peppers, not last week's, but the disadvantage is that if you do interrupt that JIT communications channel, life's difficult. At the university, we decided to close a week early. The, this, the problem, really, is that we had no fire alarms, we had no emergency lighting, at least we did have them, but after about six or seven hours they both expired. The rules say quite categorically, without emergency lighting and fire alarms, you cannot have people sleeping in um, university property. The university decided to ignore that for the first night, because the thought of waking everybody up at three in the morning and saying, hey, get up because the fire alarm's gone wrong, <laughs> um, was not something that anybody particularly wanted to do. Thereafter, there was a plan that some students went home, others slept in the Great Hall. Um, part of our problem was we hadn't really much of a clue what was going on. And I'll come back to it in a minute, but the Vice-Chancellor has complained that during Storm Desmond, nobody told him anything, really. He was left to go and look on, get, phone up somebody or living out of Lancaster and get them to look on the website and see if they could see anything relevant. <laughs> but I'll come back to as uh, Caroline mentioned earlier, the electricity at railway station did cause problems. Now, the power supply in signalling, there's a traction substation down at Garstang, there's another one up just outside Kendall, so you can, you know, that, that's where the power comes from, from the overhead wire. So the train would run perfectly happily. Um, the town supply, it was used for platform lighting, public address, CCTV, ticket machines, ticket offices, point heaters, all that sort of stuff. The rules say, unless you've got so many lumens of um, illumination on the platform, you must not board trains. Safety rule. Now, railways are an awful lot safer now than they were in, say, 1947. But um, one has to think very hard, is this rule really something that is absolutely immutable? Now, the view from the... I went to the station and talked to as many people as I could find. I first asked to speak to the station manager. They looked at me as I was asking for fat control with a top hat. <laughs> no, we don't have a station manager anymore. We've got an area interface officer or something. <laughs> oh, and he's based in Carlisle. Um, so there wasn't actually local management in the station. It's doubtless more efficient to run it with an area something or another manager based in Carlisle. But it's quite a different experience to having somebody on the ground who can say, yeah, I know the rules say this, but we've got... 3,000 students here, we've got some people with torches, let's get them onto a train and, and, and help them to get away. I did, couldn't find a picture of the local gold command, that's what I could find going back into the archives of the web. Um, but a question that came up from a lot of participants at the um, workshop was, what's all this gold command? People talked about it, but they had absolutely no impact on most people's life. And I think that's quite significant. And this is a discussion I've had previously with um, members of various gold commands, to be honest, that it's all very well sitting in a room with lots of senior people from all sorts of different businesses and, and organisations agreeing what really needs to be done. But if you haven't got an easy means of communicating with the primary school head teachers, with the university um, administrators, with all the other people who've got to take their and then decisions, then I suggest that an awful lot of what is discussed at the high level probably might have been better off um, you know, just wasting your time. Now, that may be a provocative thought, but the hierarchy, when you see this from the point of view 
of the emergency services, they have a structure. When you see it from the point of view of the users and the residents, there's a huge gap between the emergency services and all its gold, silver, bronze commands and everything else. And the poor bastards who are down at this coal face trying to make sense of it all. And that, I think, is a, is a message that came over loud and clear, in probably words somewhat stronger than that, from a lot of the people that I've spoken with. Increasingly, society is becoming complex. And this is a list of things that might indicate complexity. Firstly, with large numbers of people sharing responsibilities. A very wide geographical or organisational distribution of a single system, dependencies between critical systems, and many actors all with incentives to optimise their own end of the business, whether to make more money or just to avoid being prosecuted. And I think increasingly we're finding that a lot of our um, organisations that are responsible for things like electricity, water, gas, transport and so on, are not anymore handled by one organisation with a managing director and a fat controller or whomsoever you have, but are managed by a whole mishmash of all best value um, operating units scattered around. And that makes life difficult. And I think this is a, a fundamental question that we, one needs to think about, that in the search for economic efficiency, are we actually making more um, fragile systems? So how do we escape the dependency on electricity? How do we create resilience? Now, I think this is a, a quite important subject, which we've discussed at considerable length in, with um, DEC and with other parts of the electrical um, industry. Where should you res locate resilience? Should it be in the home? Should you say, look, okay, you need, an oxygen, you need a dialysis machine, in which case you better buy yourself a petrol generator as well, so that if the power goes off, you can still keep doing your dialysis or whatever. And that might be described as a sort of Trump solution, you know, <laughs> in, um, independent self-sufficiency. Buy a shotgun as well to keep other people away from the generator. <laughs> should it be placed with the service provider? I mean, should the obligation be on the internet provider, the mobile phone provider. But these are competitive businesses. Should you place the same rules on everyone, one particular provider? I don't know, which is a difficult question. <coughs> Should there be a requirement on the local electricity network? Possibly, but it could be expensive. And at the moment, Ofgem, who are rather concerned about not letting dis uh, distribution network operators exceed their regulated asset base, would not be very keen on people building a lot of infrastructure on the principle that it might be needed one day sometime in the next 20 or 30 years. But certainly our experience here suggests that doing nothing isn't actually an option, but what, quite what we do, I'm not sure. Now, until now, this is, I know this um, day is really all about climate, but there are a few other things as well. And it's worth just throwing in some of the other things that might cause a loss of supply. Firstly, there are various complex interactions of various network control systems. Now, I think it was about five years ago, we got fairly close to having a fairly wide-scale scale trip in parts of Britain due to what was called um, rock-off, or rate of change of frequency, where two, two units went out at much the same time, the frequency dropped quite fast, approaching the level at which other units would trip out because of uh, instability. Luckily it didn't. There are instabilities that could be introduced by um, consumer applications. So that, for example, if you all buy a Nest thermostat and you've then got millions of people all using a Nest thermostat, all of which decide to take the same sort of decisions at the same sort of time, a real herd effect, which bears no relation whatsoever to what the national grid and the distribution network operators want to do, you might well find that as a destabilising influence. You imagine that if you had a big fleet of electric vehicles and all of the battery chargers had a default setting that said, um, when the price gets down to 12 pence per unit, 
switch on your charger. So we've got time of use tariffs, price goes up and down, eventually 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock in the evening, price comes down, 12 pence a unit, bang! 30 million battery chargers all switch on at the same time. Now that's obviously an extreme example, it probably wouldn't happen, but it's those sort of issues where you have lots of independent actors making decisions that may or may not be relevant to what is being done elsewhere. We've seen some cyber attacks, WannaCry ransomware, the uh, Stuxnet worm in Iran. Um, no expert experts in this field I've come across feel that we're about to win the battle over cybercrime. Or we could have physical terrorist attacks on infrastructure. There are actually about five 400 kV lines feeding the London area from the north. Um, most of the generation is in the Midlands and the north, and most of the, most of the use is actually in London. Um, I've never tried cutting down one of those things, but um, they're all held together with bolts. I assume they just took a socket set to it. You might be able to take down the power, power station, power line. But you know, there are a whole bunch of other things that might cause a loss of electricity. And um, I think we need to bear these in mind, but also thinking about what happens with climate. It's government policy that we use more data. This is the Department for Culture, Medium and Sport website. I'll let you read it. It's fantastic. But it increases our dependence on having a 24-7 internet access, which in turn is largely dependent on having electricity. So here are a few sort of lessons and questions, I think, from Lancaster. Firstly, as a society, we are dependent on electricity. We've become a lot more dependent in the last 10 years. Government policy is encouraging us to be yet more dependent. Communications depend on the internet, which in turn depends on electricity. So, we are becoming more dependent. Should we be doing something about it? How resilient is our policy for care in the community? And for all the other use in places where we expect work um, people to be cared for out with the big hosp central hospitals. Are privatised services less resilient than when they were monolithic state-run enterprises? And should that influence perhaps the way in which we structure some of our services? Where do people go for help in nat natural disasters? Do they go to the castle? Do they go to the town hall? Do they go to the hospital? Or do they just sort of um, form a group of mates in their street? What works in villages doesn't necessarily work in, in south of tower blocks. And how do, can emergency planning teams communicate with residents when there's no electricity? This report, if you just type into Google, um, RAN, Royal Academy of Engineering, living without electricity. You'll get a copy of this. I hope to have lots to throw, throw around. Unfortunately, of the 500 we have printed, they've all gone very quickly, so I guard the last few with my life. Um, if you're going to the blackout, Tales and Storm Desmond, um, you will actually find that quite a bit of the uh, conclusions and could it happen again section here comes in sort of epilogue of Storm Desmond, but you know, that's probably where they got it from. Um, well worth thinking about, raises many of the questions I've been talking about today. So, Natalie, is that roughly the right number of hours? That's roughly the right number of minutes, yes. Okay. Uh, sorry, we can, we can say thank you very much. Questions, and I'll let you pick if people put their hand up in the usual manner. Pick questions. Yes. Can we have those two? <laughs> <laughs> um, you were saying about where should resilience for I also went to the station uh, two days later, and there was somebody in a wheelchair who was told he couldn't catch his train, he was going to the passport office um, for an appointment, and he had to catch a taxi to Oxenholm because the lift wasn't working, and nobody, nobody's allowed to carry him down the stairs. And it just seemed, couldn't some of the resilience come from manual overrides? Um, and that every lift should have a, something that could be unlocked and people could operate it manually. 
you know, like the hotel keys, the, the, there should, anything that's being made like that now, you know, the shop doors, the garage doors, so everything like that, should, could put it in regulations that it should have a manual override. I'm not quite sure how you're, I'll ask this one first, actually, unless you're going to talk about this. Uh, I'm not sure how you actually do a manual override in lift. Presumably you'd have a big handle and turn Yeah, it. well, presumably there is one that firefighters can use when people get stuck in the lift and so yeah. on. But actually to have it available so the lift could be used. I think quite quickly you run into the question of liability I'm sure you of do. risk assessment. I'm sure now, you I mean, uh, as an engineer, there are lots of things one can do mm -hmm. and one could design it with that, you know, that big handle or something mm -hmm. if necessary. Or it wouldn't be that difficult, I guess, to put some sort of clippy, clippy on type of um, ramps up mm. some stairs so you yeah. get two or three strong people who yeah. can push a wheelchair up, up the lifts, up the stairs. But once you start doing that and you put it in writing, then, it's, then you start making those people liable. And when you think of the sort of um, ambulance chasing solicitors and criminal. I'm all, not sure, but all these things I mean, it could are be possible with the right mentality. It could be done, it could be done with the right mentality and with the right general assumptions around the way that we want to manage risk. And I think in Britain, in Britain at the moment, mm. we're fairly risk averse yeah. and we're particularly risk averse when largish companies or big organisations start getting involved. And I think a lot of the individuals in those companies find it very difficult to say, yeah, well, I know the regulations say that, but look, I've got a couple of big blokes here, they can carry out a wheelchair up the stairs. But exactly that's why list designers and, and other such mechanisms have to be told you, you, know, you have to make this safe to operate. And presumably lots of fl flats and so on and have people that can't get out when there's no electricity. <coughs> Yes, it's thought, I mean, I guess it lift. has to go right back to the design of lifts. It does go right back to the design of lifts, but I think the more important thing is it goes back to the legal social structure we put around the lifts. But as engineers, if you said that's what we want to do, okay, we can do it, no problem. You'd have a lot of gearing, it would probably take about five minutes to go down and ten minutes to go up or something. Um, but that would not be too difficult to do. What would be difficult though do. is making is getting a social and organisational structure that allows that to be done without like, people saying, "Oh my God, I can't do that." My boss says I mustn't because. Mm -hmm. Shall we go to the yes, later? Yeah. Um, it's not exactly a question. It's just an update. The um, the height of the river. Yeah. You should, I live on that side of the river, which in, wasn't actually shown as being flooded on the map, which is interesting because there are a lot of the vulnerable people in Lancaster lived in those flats. But the height of the river is actually at 1.3 metres above that mark. We're trying to raise enough money to actually make a, a stone thing. Of the Lewis. But of, by the Lewis. So if anybody wants to send money to friends of Loon Bank Gardens, please do. <laughs> <laughs> but it's 1.3 metres. Yeah. Right. My early education was in the Merchant Navy. So I sailed across the Pacific and across the North Atlantic. If the lights went out on the North Atlantic, it was an emergency. If the lights went out on the Pacific, we could do it in an hour's time, basically because the weather, mm. it was flat calm. Mm. So what you've outlined to us today is a bit like the lights going out on the North Atlantic. Yeah. I still get the sense that there isn't the urgency when we're sailing on the Pacific to deal with the problem, communication wise, we still don't have that joined up thinking of whether it's with, about climate change. Um, electricity is a great example for me. I'd switch the lights out once a month because it would make people more aware of just how resilient, how unresilient we are how we need to talk between ourselves. That's one of the points you made in this report, actually, that if you live in somewhere like uh, Lagos or Baghdad, you're likely to find an average of four or five hours of like, without power a day. So you learn to live with it, you learn to work with it. If you live in a house where you've never actually had a power outage for the last five years, you get nonchalant about it. The point you make about 
focus changing is particularly so recently. If you look at what's in the headlines of the papers, yesterday it was all about harassment of women by politicians and the media's personalities and so on. Two days later, before that rather, it was all about people with blonde hair and what they said about Brexit. Um, <laughs> you know, two days before that, it was about something different. We had very much a sort of butterfly mentality. We do this one day, that the next. Now, what we're talking about here really is an industry where the average lifetime of assets is probably about 50, 40, 50 years when it comes to building pylons and substations and things of that sort. And where you already haven't got this opportunity to say, um, yes, we'll sort of change it tomorrow. You know, it, it's, it's, everything is, is such a long, long time scale, which bears really no relation to the way that politicians or anybody else tend to think about things. I was very, sorry, very interested that you, you told us that they'd lifted the substation by three weeks. Yeah. That's a wonderful opportunity to me to engage with the community to because I'm not sure how many people knew that mm -hmm. and, and what it would mean, what they would think about that. Moment. Actually, I made a mental note to myself when I get home this evening. I know the head of communications at EWL, I was going to write to him and say, Why, why isn't this all over? Why haven't you got a front page article in the local paper about this? Mm -hmm. By the way, um, I've seen lots of people taking pictures of some of the slides. I'm very happy to send you the whole lot when you've got more proper. Um, I'll leave some business cards around, and if you want, um, a copy of these slides, I'll very happily um, let you have them. Yes, Can Jacqueline. I have the, the heretical thought that maybe more notice would have been taken of all of this if it had been Henley on Thames? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yes. As you know, I'm, I'm not a heretic, um, so I, I think I won't comment on that one. Yes. <laughs> Just linking some of the comments that people have made, what the things Sergio was saying earlier around almost internal resilience and personal resilience. You had a lot of questions there about what we're doing about infrastructure resilience. Is anything being done around education and that sort of personal resilience and making sure that, that people actually have some idea of what they do? It was mentioned again this morning about the queues outside the telephone boxes and people not knowing how to use a telephone box and all those other sort of things that, that maybe we're, we're losing that sort of education. I just wondered if that was the thing that was being worked on. I know it's something that colleagues in sociology are talking about. Yeah. Um, and they're also looking very seriously at the whole sort of issues around um, social equity yeah. and social justice when it comes to how we deal with um, things of, of situations of this sort and where different groups generally have Take, take people, and Henley on Thames obviously have come top of this, people um, living in Lancaster, the log burner come next, people living in flats come down the bottom. Um, I mean, which is, okay, it's, it's, it's a bit of a parody of what it is, but it does work a bit like that. And it's, I mean, how one actually organises society such that people who are only just, only just managing, I think, to use Mrs May's <laughs> phrase, favourite phrase, um, was that, was that last week? And people who are only just managing um, just then ha also have that internal resilience where they say, oh, power's gone off, not to worry, I've got food in the fridge, I've got, you know, I think, I think it's, it can be the last straw for somebody who is in that category. When um, they say things like we're on a red alert, the environmental agency, you just get the sense that they, they have done their job, that's it, and red alert. <laughs> And you think, well, doesn't somebody therefore think, oh, it's a red alert, should what authorities then move in and do something? Presumably Gold Command knew there was a red alert, and Gold Command immediately jumped into action, presumably Saturday morning before the floods happened, and the electricity went off. Is that what happened? I haven't a clue. No. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, who is Gold Command? I mean, you mentioned them, but who is it? Where do they operate from? Who are they? And, um, Somebody else might be able to correct me, but as I understand it, it's the head of the sort of senior person of the local police, local fire brigade. Um, does anybody over there know, anyone know the, the full story of it? Um, city council. City council, I think, is... Hospital. Yeah. You said that. 
sort of, sort of, sort of, sort of senior bits of group. Now, yeah. how well those people will then communicate? I mean, the city council, <coughs> I don't know how they can possibly communicate with their, um, with the inhabitants other than by going round with a large bell getting oh yay, oh yay, the bell's well, like, going yeah. on. Yeah. I mean, it's... You've it's, got elected representatives who are the councillors. Yeah, but how many, how many local councillors, I can't see around here at them, but how many local councillors are going to say, um, right, I know the power's going to go off, now what am I going to do? How am I going to tell... Well, ones did, but the point is you need to know. So if somebody had told Green councillors that they were already doing that, in certainly in Bulk Ward, so it's an obvious way to get that information down. But it's not used. Why? You know, that's what's interesting to me. We're supposed to have a representative system, yet it doesn't really work, because the people at the top don't feel through. I think it's representative going up. I'm not convinced it comes down. <laughs> <laughs> that's the problem. I mean, wouldn't you think that, that at, at its most basic, you could, you, could, you could just distribute to every, every, every household a sort of a, a you know, basic mm -hmm. a memoir. This is, if the, this is what you do if the power goes out, and these are the kinds of things that you could do with having in, like... Candles, a plug-in phone, it's a, you know a battery, a battery pack or something like that. There, there, there are um, wind-up radio or battery-powered radio. That you could you could have some basic information that is in every household, and that that there would be then a system of triggering it of people being warned that this might you might encounter this shortly. Read it and do something about it when it happens. Um, thanks. Notice there's a lot of, particularly well, I live in Halton and there's a hydro, okay, it was knocked out in Storm Desmond, but there's a hydro generating power uh, there and there's an awful lot of um, solar panels on roofs and yet, uh, for some reason, it seems impossible to use those when there's a power um, outage. Why is that and is anybody doing about it? It is possible. Um, there are fairly strict regulations that say that if you're going to do what's in, in the trade is called islanding, mm -hmm. where you make yourself a power island. You have to be completely isolated from the mains, partly because the people responsible for the mains, in a lot of um, loss of supply incidents, it's actually a fault that they're working on. The last thing they want is someone to switch on all their solar panels and start putting power back down the, down the wire going the wrong way, that then electrocute their, their electricians working on the job. So there are regulations like that. It's actually quite expensive to put together a, um, a mechanism that will do the changeover, that you probably need a battery as well, because your solar panels can't cope with sudden pulses in energy, like when you switch on, um, <coughs> or I, I don't know, a hairdryer or something, you, you get, and you see the light suddenly go dim and then get bright again or whatever. Um, so they can't cope very well with that type of pulse demand, so you need some sort of storage you need some sort of switch over mechanism. All great, can all be done, not you know, a few hundred pounds, a thousand pounds by the time you pay someone to do it. But if you're only going to use it once every blue moon, how is it better to do that or is it better to have um, candles? I don't know. Certainly at the university we're looking very seriously but because we have a 2.2 megawatt combined heat and power plant that runs part of the central heating system for the campus and also can provide a couple of megawatts of, of electricity. We've got a two megawatt wind turbine and during Storm Desmond there was certainly no shortage of wind. <laughs> so we've got a total generating capacity of about four megawatts. The average demand on campus normally is about five megawatts and it peaks at about eight megawatts. Now, we could in theory switch off our supply, the 11 kV feeders from the NWL operate the university as a central as a group. But then we'd need to find something that managed the frequency. We'd probably have to have load shedding so we could cut down the power to what we actually had. So if the wind dropped, we switched off some of the ventilation fans in some of the rooms or whatever. And we've looked at that and it's got lots of noughts on the end of it, the price. Um, now, again, this is one of those debates you, you have to have within an organization saying, we could do all these things, or we could just buy a small petrol generator in the Vice Chancellor's office and hope it all works after that. <laughs> we've actually got a sort of compromise that we've got a number of um, buildings which we consider as being key, 
such as the library now, where students can go to in the event of a, a problem, and they have individual generators. But the thought of saying, right, now let's replumb everything, or rewire everything, so what we're doing then is, is feeding the entire campus from the big generators we've got. That's actually quite a complicated thing. You know, by the time you've got auto-synchronisation and automatic switch-offs of things, there's, there's quite a bit of, of logic that goes with it. Unless you've got a generator that you know is so big that you can never actually take more load than it's prepared to give. I was just ask if you've got I mean, two things. One is on the social justice dimension. You mentioned the, the flats and so on. Is there any data on any, any of, of that, either qualitative data to interviews or, or actual data? You know, looking at the actual impacts on different groups of people to, to kind of... We haven't got any serious data. It was this, the... Because um, it's, it was kind of quite anecdotal what we had. It was, it was anecdotal. I believe some of our um, sociology colleagues have done something a bit more detailed about percentages of, of high rise and all the rest of it. I haven't. I mean, I, I, I must admit, I've, I've been really approaching this from the um, electrical engineer end rather than from the um, social, social scientist end. Um, I mean, it's quite it's relatively easy to, to, to make the calculation to say, well, what will happen? What's more difficult is to say, well, how will that affect people? And certainly when I've um, talked with, um, I don't know, wife's, my wife's cousin who lives in a very large tower block in um, Harrogate, quite a nice tower block actually, with a lot of retired people, a lot of people in wheelchairs, a lot of use of the, of the lifts, <coughs> electric entry system, access control, a lot of rooms that are sort of inside without Natural, vent natural light or ventilation, relying on fans and, and what have you, then they said, oh my God, that could happen to us. But I, I haven't got any data as to how many people that have actually applied to and what the effects would be. Yeah, and the other question I was just going to ask about is just comparative over time, because I remember you know, going back, when you feel old, it's a, you know, the three day week, mm -hmm. and where you had you know, period, you know, long periods out without electricity, systematic. Yeah. It's done systematically, which didn't seem to have the same kind of vulnerabilities that you've got now. So I just wondered what, what the comparative, whether any comparative work's been done like that. I think that the big change is what we use electricity for. Yeah. Yeah. In those days, remembering back, I seem to remember at home we had a, um, an anthracite burner or something. Um, it had a back boiler, and so it could heat quite a bit of the house without actually. Um, needing to have electricity. Mm. We um, had newspapers that came so we could read what was happening, um, gas cookers that didn't have automatic electric ignition and electric phone failure devices on them. Um, all those sort of things meant we just didn't have this same dependence on electricity that we have now. Yeah. Yeah. Phone books. Hmm? Everyone had phone books. Didn't have mobile phones. And so altogether, we were, because you, you probably know that the, the, the um, phone exchange has got a very big battery, which actually keeps supplied the um, <coughs> landline phone in your house. It's, it's actually powered by the phone exchange through the battery. Um, and they have generators that keep the battery topped <coughs> up in the event of nasty things happening. But if you think back to, to those, those sort of situation you had there, it was really very different to where we are now. I mean, the, the flat that, um, 20 odd years ago, lived in a flat in the suburbs of Paris, and that didn't have force ventilation, it had a big chimney duct going up, and just by the very fact that it had a sort of hole in the roof, you know, a sort of a duct and a cowl and everything else, it automatically sucked air out of the um, bits of the building, like toilets and um, corridors and so on, without an extractor fan. Now you would build it with an extractor fan, rather than just using a, a duct of that sort. Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned the where should resilience be, that slide there. I mean, looking, just feeding back, it looked as though the absolute key thing here was, was mobile phones. Al almost the most, the thing that would have made a big difference. It didn't sound to me all that difficult to put a leaf-sized battery at each mobile phone pass. 
has have the part have the part that the powers that be decided where the right place to intervene is to get rid of some of the worst aspects of this. I think the problem with mobile phones is that you're on a particular um, yeah. tariff with a particular group, mm -hmm. and if you've got an O2 phone, and there's a Vodafone phone. If Vodafone have a battery, it doesn't help you. So everybody's probably got to have a battery. Yeah, um, batteries are expensive. They're also eminently nickable. I mean, if you go down the pub, there isn't actually much of a market for um, a one kilowatt 4G transmitter. You know, it's not the sort of thing that you <laughs> trade very often. Batteries, particularly if you've got um, people going on caravanning holidays or whatever, really interesting. Lots of people would like batteries. So you've got something then that's a, that's a high value, mm -hmm. probably cost more than the rest of the, mm -hmm. the phone mask. Mm -hmm. That's probably a, got a lifetime of what, 15 years before it sort of sulfates up or whatever phones do nowadays. Um, and then um, it may not actually even be used once in that 15 years mm -hmm. if you're just one of the lucky people who live in a place where um, you know, you've got no, haven't had any, this sort of size of power card. So I, I think, yes, it'd be a good place to put it. I was talking with a guy who's chairman of the European um, phone providers or something, I can't remember exactly what the name of the job is. And he said that, that one time the EU was trying to argue that phone providers should keep at least, I don't know, 36 hours worth of energy. And they sort of basically did the, the economic sums and convinced him, well, yeah, if, if the population of Europe want to spend 50% more on their phones, great, you know, we'll, we'll provide it. And the assumption was it wouldn't. Mm. Yeah, yeah, just on that, I was chatting to a, a telecoms consultant with phone companies, and he was saying that where they have done this in some parts of London, put extra batteries um, on the base stations because they're on roofs. They've actually had to get into strengthening the roofs, and it's quite rapidly become extremely expensive. But the point I wanted to make was I'm quite interested in community electric vehicle charging points and the thought of having them on community buildings where if there was something like this the cars could actually power the buildings so putting in the right technology to make that happen and you mentioned a thousand pounds for the cost of doing that earlier what's your take on how much it would cost for that sort of system yeah the, 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 the techie term for what you're describing is called v2g vehicle to grid um, recharge great if a few people do it if a large number of people do it, even better, until it goes wrong. And some of the failure modes of large-scale V2G are actually fairly nasty. Now, um, I see we're already overrunning time, yeah, so I'll chair into the second. We've got to stop in a second. Yeah. Put it this way, I have actually done a 45-minute lecture in, in Beijing, actually, about the uh, design of V2G systems and some of the upsides and downsides. Um, it's quite a big... No, I don't think we can cover it here, but it's, it's not quite as smooth as some of the politicians might lead you to believe. I think that's a really good I think we need to 